Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's stream. My name is Kyle. I'm with High Point Scientific, and you are looking at a live view of the Dumbbell Nebula. This is also known as Messier 27 in Charles Messier Original Catalog of Messier Objects, located about 1,360 light years away from the Earth. I'll be your host tonight as we share with you live views of the nighttime sky. We're also joined tonight by Tegan, who is providing these live views through his telescope located in Ohio. We've got some great views in store for you tonight, ranging from the Dumbbell Nebula, the Cygnus Wall, the Ring Nebula, and many more beautiful objects in the summer sky. We'll also be taking your questions about astronomy and the nighttime sky. Do us a favor though, if you're watching this on YouTube and this is the first stream you've attended with us, feel free to like this video and also subscribe to our channel. We do these live streams pretty frequently and it's your support and engagement that really helps drive the uh, drive the views up and also get people excited about astronomy in the nighttime sky. It's what we love to do. I see one question coming in. Um, have let's see. And again, this is a live view of this nebula. This is again the Dumbbell Nebula in the constellation of Volpecchia. Deep Sky San Dan says, hey Kyle, looking forward to seeing some nebulae. You're gonna see a lot of that tonight. We'll spend about 15 minutes per target tonight, uh, just sort of getting a good look at this. Right now, Tegan's recalibrating PhD2 on his end. We're gonna try to get a little bit of a higher contrast view. Right now, he's just trying to tune in his guiding. Mike checking in from the Huntsville Space Center. We have Michael checking in from Southeast Georgia. Steve Morris checking in saying they have very good skies tonight here in PA. Tanya says humid as ever here in North Carolina. Good stuff. So the Dumbbell Nebula is a planetary nebula. A planetary nebula is basically sort of the remnants of a star. It's not quite the same as a supernova event, for example. This is more similar to a star like the sun reached the end of its life and it's sort of ejecting its inner gases out into space. Um, this is a star at the very end of its life and at the center of this nebula is what's called a white dwarf. So planetary nebula are really cool. They're also really, really small and really, uh, really bright. So it's really easy to be able to see them. For example, the Dumbbell Nebula is something you can easily spot in a pair of binoculars if you're at a dark sky site. But if you have a telescope, especially a large telescope, you can see a ton of detail on the Dumbbell Nebula. You can also see some of these filaments that you can see here in this image. So we do have some more longer sub-exposures coming in in just a few minutes. The Dumbbell Nebula, though I was just talking about how small these objects are in the nighttime sky, the Dumbbell Nebula is only eight arc minutes across, so it is very, very small. And again, it is located 1,600 light years away from the Earth. During this live stream, you hear me talk a lot about light years, and it's kind of hard to grapple the concept of a light year if you're new to the new to the topic, but a light year is basically how astronomers measure distance in the universe. It's very hard to measure distance when you are talking about stars, nebula, and especially galaxies in terms of kilometers or miles or any other uh, form of measurement we're used to on the day-to-day -day life. So what astronomers do is they measure how far light travels in a year and use that as sort of the baseline for the measurement system. So a thousand 360 light years away from the Earth means that this nebula is located 1,360 light years away. But in addition to that, that also means it took 1,360 Earth years for the light from this nebula to reach Tegan's camera. So we're looking back in time because light travels fast, but it doesn't travel infinitely fast. It takes time to travel between point A and point B. So we're looking again at the Dumbbell Nebula, not as it is, but as it was 1,360 years ago. 
So that blows my mind every time. If it doesn't blow your mind, I think you might be watching the wrong live stream. Got a question about what size scope is being used for this live stream. Tegan is using a 10 inch Quattro, I believe a reflector telescope. He's also using a three nanometer hydrogen alpha filter, a ZWASI 294 uh, monochrome camera, an IOP and a IOPTRON CM60. Good deal. There we go. So we have a much better view coming in. As you can see, what Tegan is doing is he's adjusting the contrast to be a little higher. By doing that, he's adjusting the exposure. So in astronomy, there's this concept of what's called SNR or signal to noise ratio. Basically, the more signal you have, the uh, lower the noise ratio is. So Tegan, by increasing the exposure, is actually increasing the amount of signal coming to a sensor but while also sort of uh, decreasing the noise as well. So as the SNR ratio gets higher, the views get better, the contrast gets a little higher as well. Mike wanting to know why the HA filter for the bright broadband object just to flex on people, of course. We'll be using, uh, we'll be looking at some HA fil objects a little later on in the stream, so might as well get accustomed to it. But if you have an HA filter, even though the uh, Dumbbell Nebula is a broadband target, an HA filter will bring out some, you know, detail. got a question from Taylor. Uh, Bradshaw on their essay asking, I have equipment, relatively new to equipment, and doing astrophotography. What is a good resource on easy DSO objects to gather photons on versus challenging? So if I'm understanding that question correctly, you're looking for good resources on easy deep sky objects to take images of. Oh, that's a great question. There's definitely a lot of different resources you can use. I just recommend checking out our Astronomy Hub. If you go to the High Point Scientific website, go to the Astronomy Hub. We have great sort of beginner targets for astrophotography. Tegan is suggesting in the chat that I'm with uh, possibly switching to an Oxygen 3 filter to show the difference between Oxygen 3 and HA, and I think that is a great idea. We have a question from Adrienne. They're asking, when you mention gases surrounding the star, what are the gases consisting of? That is an excellent question. So most of the gases you're going to be seeing in this image are is hydrogen alpha, but you also have a different elements too form the star. Most of the, I believe it's what, 60% of the universe is hydrogen and 30% is helium and the rest is the stuff that makes us up. Um, to answer that question, mostly hydrogen and helium, but you also have trace elements such as carbon and oxygen and other things that help you be able to see with these filters. Another, another hey, uh, Kyle, Tegan? Tegan here. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tegan. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, we are switching um, filters real quick. On the Dumbbell Nebula, um, this last um, exposure just finished. This is a uh, three-minute hydrogen alpha um, sub-exposure. I have just switched to my um, oxygen filter, which is also a three-nanometer filter, and it's going to show the differences um, in 
signal coming from the um, ions emitted by or the um, hydrogen alpha um, ions and the uh, oxygen three, and that should be coming up in about three minutes. Good deal. Yeah, so Tegan, while I have you on here, if you want to talk a little bit about your setup, though, and your as well as your journey as an astrophotographer, and why are you outside being bitten by mosquitoes at 1030 at night? <laughs> well, I'm outside right now because there's nothing better than sh shooting nebula, especially, you know, especially if, if you get to share it with, with the entire world or whoever's viewing. I think that's absolutely incredible. Um, but as Kyle said, I am using a 10-inch uh, Newtonian which, you know, astrophotographers consider a light bucket. It's a 10 inch mirror. It gathers a lot of light, which is exceptional for uh, dimmer targets and even better for brighter targets. Um, and it does show a lot of detail. So I'm excited to have that up and running tonight, um, along with the uh, ASI 294 monochrome camera and my three nanometer hydrogen alpha oxygen um, filters as well. And this setup I've been running for a couple years now, and it's been extremely consistent and so much fun to use. Good deal. We have another question coming in. This question is for Tegan uh, from Paul Norris. Paul wants to know what shutter speed is being used. So they're just asking what, how long of an exposure you are taking here. So right now I am taking um, three minute exposures and I'm bending my camera two by two uh, simply for the live view, just to make everything just a tad brighter. Um, but yes, we are using three minute exposures and we'll likely continue to use three minute exposures throughout the night. Good, good deal. I have a question from David Scott and they're asking if a spaceship traveled through the nebula, would it hit anything? That's a fantastic question. You might be looking at this nebula and wondering to yourself, man, that nebula is huge, but it's actually incredibly diffuse. It is hardly any more diffuse than the background space it is surrounding. It is so diff diffuse, in fact, that if you were to travel right through it at the speed of light, nothing, absolutely nothing would happen to your spacecraft, and the risk of hitting anything would be no different from anywhere else in the Milky Way, but it's just a very diffuse object, and it is a very, very large object, too. You can almost think of it as just a big ball of gas out there. You know, if you travel through a ball of gas in your car, that might not necessarily be a problem for your car. Our uh, first sub exposure just came through from oxygen, and you can tell um, right away that the structure is just completely different. Um, let's see if we can brighten it a little bit. Eh, that might be a tad too bright. Um, but the outer shell looks a little bit smoother. Um, you can't really see the, uh, the filaments as strong in the hydrogen alpha channel, but it does take on a much different shape. Good deal. And Tegan, could you tell us a little bit about the software you're using tonight? Yes. So um, what you're looking at right now is Sequence Generator Pro. And this runs my mount, my cameras, um, my auto guider, and my, I control my filter wheel, my exposures. Everything is run through this software. Um, I connect everything to my laptop. Um, and when I am ready to image, I hit Run Sequence. And everything is automated to run throughout the night. And I'm um, guiding my camera and, or, and my scope and my mount using... Um, PhD2, which keeps the stars pinpoint throughout the long exposure. Another question for Tegan coming in. Uh, Hector Rodriguez is asking, how expensive is a setup like yours? So general ballpark if somebody's looking to recreate um, these types of image quality. Well, you know, there are different mounts that can hold this um, capacity of scope. The reflectors, like the Skywatcher Quattro, tend to be you know, good bang for your buck. They, they don't use, you know, um, fluorite glass like apochromatic refractors are, which are extremely expensive. So and I think an eight inch or 10 inch newt, you know, runs anywhere from 800 to $1,300. And, um, you know, with filters, depending on what filters you get and cameras and mounts, um, it's, it can go anywhere from, you know, 4,000 to 6,500, maybe a little less, a little more, give or take. It, it ranges drastically um, depending, you know, on what, what kind of uh, mount or what kind of equipment that you decide to purchase. But these kind of photos are achievable with equipment that is much less expensive. 
Absolutely. As a matter of fact, again, we talked a little bit about our astronomy hub here on our High Point Scientific website, but if you go on our astronomy hub, we have a breakdown of some of the different equipment that you can use for beginner astrophotographers to be able to take images that may not be as good of such small objects like a dumbbell nebula, but you can still get beautiful images of things like the Orion Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy. So Tegan, I think we've looked at this for a good solid 15 minutes or so, but how would you feel about if we switched to another target, perhaps maybe the uh, Cygnus wall, for example? Uh, yes, absolutely. Let's see here. The Cygnus wall is um, in NGC 7000, otherwise known as the North American Nebula. Let me stop my auto guider. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and slew my telescope right over there. And we'll see what we come up with. So you might be able to hear it in the background, but you can actually hear Tegan's uh, telescope mount actually slewing around. So you're going to see the star streak for a second. That's totally normal. You're going to be that's a result of the sort of the telescope slewing around and um, that rapid motion causing the stars to sort of blur. Okay, well, actually, I stopped the exposure, so we're not going to see any of that. I'm taking a 15-second exposure right now just to make sure that we have the Cygnus wall in frame, and then I'm going to increase that back up to three minutes using my hydrogen alpha filter. For sure. While he's doing that, I see another question coming in from, uh, they're asking, you mentioned different gases within the nebula. How do you know? Hope it's not a weird question. That's actually a fantastic question, not weird at all. So astronomers know because we're able to look out into space and sort of measure the different wavelengths of light. Those wavelengths represent different elements. And so astronomers are able to look at the, uh, the spectrograph sort of, if you can imagine, of nebula, be it an emission nebula or a reflection nebula. In this case, the dumbbell nebula is what's called an emission nebula. And emission levels, nebula, excuse me, leave very, very precise uh, sort of signals. And those signals indicate, those wavelengths indicate the uh, elements associated with it. So right now, Tegan has slewed over to the Cygnus wall and he's just working on increasing the exposure a little bit to get a brighter view. Yes, this is just a 15 second sub. Um, we are already one minute into our three minute exposure and it's gonna reveal the, the detail and the signal incredibly. This is one of my favorite targets of all time just because it sticks out so well against the, the, the black background. It's, it's a beautiful target. It really is. It's one of my favorites as well. If you have a uh, monochrome camera, definitely recommend checking that out. It's a great for not only RGB, but for a, uh, you know, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen images. So again, if you're just tuning in, my name is Kyle. I'm joined by Tika tonight, and we're just sharing with you live views of some of the really cool nebula that you can see in the nighttime sky this time of year. If this is your first time watching a live stream, please feel free to uh, subscribe to our channel as well as like the video. That just sort of boosts the algorithm in our favor. It helps people, more people get interested in the stream. And as a result, it just sort of gets more people excited and engaged about astronomy in the nighttime sky. That's what we're here to do. We have Alan out here shooting a comet for the first time since Neowise, getting a good run on Comet C2017 K2. I remember uh, Comet Neowise about two years ago, and that was by far one of the most spectacular comets. Well, it was actually the only comet I've ever seen. I, uh, I revealed my age here, unfortunately, in that I was too young to remember Comet uh, Hale Bop in 1997. I was a toddler at the time. So I did not see any, I have never seen a comet until 2020. I was in a, uh, I remember going, driving out to a cornfield in the middle of uh, Peoria, Illinois and setting up my telescope and I could see the comet on the horizon and man, it was just the most beautiful sight. Uh, John Richards, Tegan, we have another question. Lots of questions for Tegan tonight. John wanting to know what guide scope and guide camera are you using? 
so my guide camera is the QHY 5L-2. It's actually about seven years old and is still running strong. And I am using an off-axis guider, so my Quattro is my guide scope. And oh, that is a beautiful our view. exposure came up. <laughs> it gets me every time. That is amazing. Absolutely gorgeous. It really is. And again, this is what I believe hydrogen alpha filter you're using right now? Yes, hydrogen alpha. So could you describe, you mentioned earlier that you're using a three nanometer uh, hydrogen alpha filter. Could you describe the difference between seven nanometers, five nanometers, three nanometers, and like why would one want it? Why would one want a three nanometer filter over like a seven or 12 nanometer filter? Absolutely. Um, the narrower the, um, the band pass, the more contrast that you're going to get and the less outside signal that's going to be, you know, hitting your camera sensor. So versus like a 12 nanometer, or I think they even have, you know, I, I guess 12 nanometers, the widest for imaging. Um, that's just, it's not going to be as narrow as the three nanometer. It's not going to allow as much contrast. Your stars are going to be a little bit small, are, are going to be smaller with a three nanometer filter. Um, signal is going to be a little bit um, stronger with the three nanometer filter as well. And if you're imaging in a very heavily light polluted area, a three nanometer filter is going to block out much more light pollution than a 12 nanometer. Um, that being said, three, five, seven, 12 nanometers are, are, are going to produce some great images regardless. For sure. For sure. I've actually seen astrophotographers actually go as far as when apods who live in the middle of new york city for example who are able to get like super long exposures with like a three nanometer filter so they are definitely worth the investment if you're into deep sky astrophotography and you have a monochrome camera uh we have some more questions coming in uh mike asking for beginners can you explain the relationship between polar alignment and auto guiding that is a great question mike i am glad you asked it so basically an auto guider sort of corrects for the error in the tracking of your telescope mount. Telescope mounts, unfortunately, are imperfect with their tracking. No such thing as perfect tracking. You are always going to need an auto guider or something to correct for those tiny, minute errors in your tracking. So to be able to really have good guiding, you need to have a precise polar alignment. Uh, the pole star, is also known as Polaris, is located nearby the North Celestial Pole. And... It is a useful guiding reference sort of to be able to point your mount directly to the North Celestial Pole. And to have a precise polar alignment means you get really good sub-exposures. Uh, Alan asking, if using a 294 MC Pro, different from the MM, so this is a color camera he's talking about, to shoot, what filters would be good? I personally have the L Extreme filter a 1.25 L Extreme filter, and I find that works wonders with a color camera. Mm -hmm. I've actually been able to sort of uh, cheat a little bit with Pixinsight and use, like, say, for example, go out on two different nights and shoot an LRGB image and combine that with HA data from the L Extreme filter and then combine that into Pixinsight to get a much better image. So if you actually go on our, our YouTube channel, we have a tutorial on how to do that is a really useful trick that I've learned. David wanted to know what slash when was the first nebula recorded? Ooh, that is a really interesting question. That's not actually a question I n can say precisely offhand because when you think about it, uh, a lot of these nebulae that you can see in the night sky are visible with the naked eye, so they probably have been seen since antiquity. I know Ptolemy's cluster has been spotted uh, for centuries. That was obviously spotted by Ptolemy. The Andromeda galaxy was also believed was noted by both Chinese and Arabic astronomers, although they weren't exactly aware of what it was. And as a matter of fact, nobody was really aware what the Andromeda galaxy truly was until the great debate of the early part of the 1900s concluded when Edwin Hubble conclusively proved that the Andromeda galaxy was outside of the Milky Way. So a little bit of a long tirade on your question, but truthfully, we don't know when the first nebula was recorded. We do know that Charles Messier, uh, for which the Messier catalog is named after, was the first to really take the time to catalog the different Messier objects, the sort of the brighter nebula, like the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, the Dumbbell Nebula, so on and so forth. So that is a fantastic question. Okay, new sub-exposure, just three minutes, once again. Um, 
I know there is a lot of sulfur um, signal in this area. So we're going to see what a sulfur-2 filter can capture in a three-minute exposure. Good deal. Saw a comment come in from Cynthia. I think I might have missed it. It says, that's so amazing. I have always been fascinated with astronomy. My daddy got me interested, and I have enjoyed exploring ever since. Again, keep the questions coming tonight. It is uh, absolutely great to be able to talk to each and every one of you. I had my um, sight set for the Crescent Nebula next, which is right overhead. But if anyone has any um, other requests, perhaps, um, of nebula they would like to see i can check and see if it's available to me um above the tree line absolutely guys we don't have a sort of written down list of what we want to view tonight so if you have anything you want to see that you think might be interesting in the night sky please let us know in the comments and we will try to be able to point to it so we'll probably spend another five minutes or so here let the next subframe come in, and then we'll probably slew on to the next target. Eric wanting to know, how would this nebula look in a one-shot color DSLR? So that's a great question, and it sort of depends on what type of DSLR you're using. If you're using a regular, you know, DSLR with no modification to it whatsoever, it'll appear sort of, I almost want to say pinkish, almost bluish from experience. That's because DSLRs mm -hmm. don't do a really good job at capturing hydrogen alpha, so those deep reds with HA... Uh, are sort of cut off by the DSLR. But if you want to be able to mod your camera a little bit, you can capture more of that red. So you can actually get something that looks pretty similar to a one-shot color camera uh, image. So you can get a uh, you can get some good views with a DSLR. Actually, first time I ever shot this nebula was with a DSLR. Uh, Scott's Astrophotos is asking, can you get the Lagoon Nebula? Scott? I wish I could get the Lagoon Nebula. It's behind the trees, and that's you know that's it's it's pretty low here, um, and that's one of my targets that has always evaded me, and unfortunately, it will evade me tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really quick, one last question, then we have some more suggestions. Uh, David Scott wanted to know what is the closest nebula to the Earth. That is a good question. The closest nebula to the Earth is um, the closest nebula that we're most familiar with is probably the Orion Nebula. But the Pleiades mm -hmm. star cluster is the closest open star cluster, and that's about 500 light years away from the Earth. Uh, I saw a suggestion from Scott, and they're asking if we can see the Ring Nebula. Yes, actually, we do. I do have a good vision um, view of the Ring Nebula. And Sweet. to answer um, Birdman I, or um, Justin's question, I am using the 294 nice. monochrome. So we are going to take a look over at the Ring Nebula, I believe. I believe that was the first request that came in. Okay. And a uh, quick uh, subframe of the sulfur data came through. You can see it's, you know, hydrogen is, it's not nearly as um, dense as the hydrogen, but sulfur provides a very nice ridge line here along the Cygnus wall when post-processing. And it does appear... Um, pretty strong once you start to uh, stack the data for sure looks like you had a satellite go through there too as well oh yes it does from uh yeah diagonal from left to right lots of satellites in the nighttime sky this time of, uh, as of late it's very rare for my sub exposures when i'm doing astrophotography for some sort of satellite not to go through the field of view Fortunately, it does stack out fairly easy. It's never been a really problem for me, especially if you use, uh, you know, Sigma clipping in your stacking algorithms. But there are more satellites. Uh, Tegan would probably absolutely agree with that too. There's definitely been an increase in sort of the density of satellites. We are going to the Ring Nebula right now. Sweet. I'm gonna go back to Hydrogen Alpha. Now this one's really bright. I'm gonna have to play around with the sub exposure um, and the stretching a little bit, but nonetheless, it should be a pretty awesome view. The Ring Nebula was actually the first planetary nebula I took a look at, and it is by far one of my favorites. It's so small, 
but it is so bright and it is by far one of my favorites. It's also known as the uh, Messier 57. I draw a blink, drew a blink there for a second. And it's also in the constellation of Lyra at the Harp. <laughs> Look at that right there. Tiny, very tiny. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a... Um, You know, I'm going to do another three three minute sub exposure, I think, and then um, bring the stretching way down so we can see the the inner detail in the filaments. I don't think that should blow it out. You can see why they call these planetary nebula now because they're so tiny, and if you're coming across it for the first time, you almost might be tempted to think it's a planet or a comet of some sort because its disk is resembles a circular disk like a planet would be. So John Richards is wondering if we could do the Seder region next. Um, and that's actually a project I'm currently working on. So the Butterfly Nebula, I think, would be a fantastic region to look at. I Very absolutely... strong in the hydrogen alpha signal. I absolutely agree. I think that'd be a great target to go to next after that. We have a question. Don Wank knows the pinwheel galaxy possible. Unfortunately, not tonight. Um, simply because this stream is going to be focused on nebula, not galaxies. Galaxies are mostly broadband targets, so if you use a hydrogen alpha filter on a galaxy, it's not going to turn out very well. You're not going to be able to see much. Uh, galaxies are strictly uh, broadband. Got a question from John. They're asking, seeing just now from a post my cousin made. July 12th, in the article it says, we will start receiving full color images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Will these be available for the public to begin viewing right away as well? And they absolutely will be. As a matter of fact, NASA is making a nice big event about this. Uh, for those who don't know, the James Webb Space Telescope launched back in December. I'm sure everybody knows about that now by this point. But it is the largest space telescope ever launched and also the most expensive. I think it was, what, like $10 billion? It launched on the Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana on December 25th. It spent a few weeks going out to what's called the L2 Lagrange point, about 1.5 million miles away from the Earth, and station keeping out there. And during the period of the last six months or so, it's been spending the time sort of cooling down the mirrors, getting deployed, sort of collimating the mirrors, getting everything nice, precise. I, there are tons of mirror segments on that thing. So getting sort of that precise collimation is super critical. So they are now just getting to the first images of from the James Webb Space Telescope and they are expecting to release the first on July 12th and I'm so excited and there will be a big NASA event for that as well so tune in David wanting to know again, uh, what is the most challenging nebula to find with a telescope? That is a good question, David. Um, it depends on what your equipment is and what your skill set is. For example, if you have a large telescope and tons of experience, you might be challenged to find something like the uh, Barnard's Loop or the uh, Horsehead Nebula. Those can be very challenging nebula to find. But if you have a really small telescope, you might uh, find the most challenging nebula to find is the ring nebula, for example. So it, to answer your question, it sort of just depends on what your skill set is and what you your equipment is. There are... So, uh, Go ahead, Tegan. Oh, I'm sorry, Kyle. Our, our first sub-exposure came in, and it, it looks like it's completely um, oversaturated. But if I um, do no auto-stretch and zoom in here um, quite a bit, Let's maybe, hmm, I don't know if, if uh, Kyle, you can you can make out the, the, the central details here. It's um, hard to see from my end. Ring you can definitely up. see a ring. Kind of looks like the uh, black hole image of M87, from right. M87, <laughs> to be truthful. It's, it's hard to see much detail here, so uh, it it looked a lot better when it was stretched, but it, you, could, you couldn't really see any central... Sort yeah, it looks, that's a low stretch. You know, it looks completely blown out here. But um, let's see. Then I think we could move on to yeah. uh, the Seda region. Okay. I agree. Let's move let's on to the Seda region and see what we can get there. So the Seda region is going to look a lot like sort of the sickness wall region. So there's going to be a lots of nebulosity there.
Mike says, it just looks like an out-of-focus star. (laughs) Yeah. So what Tegan's Um, pulling up here is actually his framing sort of assistant. So uh, Sequence Generator Pro and other programs like Nina, uh, for example, all have this sort of framing assistance, and it's a nice tool to sort of have. David wanting to know, do you guys have a favorite Nebula? Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> you can't go wrong with the Orion Nebula. Let's be real here. Um, the Orion Nebula. Okay, I'm just gonna say it. I'm I'm basic, so I'm just gonna say the Orion Nebula. It's my favorite <laughs> Nebula. It's my favorite to photograph. I can never pass it up. The Pleiades might be number two for me. That's more of a reflection nebula and some galaxies. My favorite, or stars, I say, not galaxies. Getting my terminology mixed up here. Uh, how about you, Tegan? Oh, it looks like we lost Sequence Generator Pro. Uh oh. Did the whole thing crash for you? It it looks like it might have, but that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, have so up and running here in a minute. Okay, um, so while but, that's going, we're just going to switch over to a view of Stellarium while Tegan addresses some technical issues. Not a problem. But while we're waiting for the views to come back, um, I will be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Oh, I would say my favorite nebula. Okay, I do like the Orion Nebula, um, but. The, the nebula, I think, that made the most impact on me when I first started imaging was probably the Crescent Nebula. Um, that's that's always been extremely fat. Or the Eagle, the Pillars of Creation. I would say the Pillars of Creation are is is my is my favorite. Those are really good ones, and both of which I believe are out in the sky this time of year. That is correct. I do not have access to the Pillars of Creation here in my backyard, unfortunately. So again, if you're just tuning in, you're wondering where the views went. Uh, Tegan's working on getting some technical issues squared away on his end, but we expect those views to be back in a minute. So what you're looking at is a sort of a simulated view of the nighttime sky. And we're just sort of, you know... We'll have to be patient. Anybody who's done astrophotography can relate to this. I can show you some of where these objects we've been looking at are in the nighttime sky, though. For example, right here we have the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. Located within that is the star Deneb. Deneb is a supergiant star about 2,000 light years away from the Earth. So that is a good view to have. And But nearby the, const- the star Deneb, you can see the North American Nebula. So this is NGC, I believe it's... 2,000, if I'm not mistaken, 2,000 or 7,000, I should say. And we were look, taking a look at, at this sort of region right here. This is known as the Cygnus Wall. You can sort of definitely see a vague wall shape right here. Okay, I think we are up and running. Okay, let's take, let's check it out. We are back. Okay, yeah, so we are at the Butterfly Nebula, which is very close to the star Sater, or Sater, however you'd like to pronounce that. Um, This is a very dense region in hydrogen alpha and is absolutely gorgeous, almost as pretty as the Cygnus Wall, I would say. Um, So this three-minute sub-exposure coming up should be pretty spectacular. For sure. While we're waiting for that three-minute sub-exposure to pop up, we have a question from Mike, and they're asking, Total Novice just acquired an 8SC and would really love to learn astrophotography. Are my chances good with this scope? Um, To answer your question, yes and no. It entirely depends on what you're using with your 8SC. If you're using like a equatorial mount, then you should be able to take long exposures. But if you're using the like an alt azimuth mount, you're probably only gonna be really limited to planetary and lunar imaging. And that's just simply to do with the rotation of the earth. If you're using an alt azimuth mount, uh, what happens is you get what's called field of view rotation, but with an equatorial mount that's aligned with the north celestial pole, you're sort of uh, rotating with the uh, direction of the Earth's motion, the sidereal motion, I should say, and you can take long exposures as a result. So I would say uh, it can be. Selma's saying, I see gray only, no definite image. And that's totally okay. If you're wondering where the view is, 
just give it a few more minutes. We're waiting for a longer exposure to come in, so you're not going to be able to see much more than some gray fuzzy patches right now. But once a longer exposure comes in, remember we talked a little bit about SNR or signal to noise ratio. So the more signal you catch, the uh, lower the noise and the better the view. So just give it a few minutes and a brighter view will be visible. Okay, we just passed the two minute mark on this exposure. So about 50 more seconds and the um, a new frame should pop up. And if you remember, if you watched our view of the Cygnus wall, you'll agree that the view three minutes is significantly better. And for those tuning in who um, aren't aware of the equipment, I'm using a um, Skywatcher 10 inch um, Deutonian, the Skywatcher 10 inch Quattro, uh, three nanometer hydrogen alpha filters, an ASI 294 monochrome imaging camera, and the Ioptron CEM60 equatorial mount. And the uh, software is Sequence Generator Pro, and this is controlling all of the equipment that I use and the ex sub exposures. Alan saying the biggest impact for me in terms of what his favorite nebula was was the Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation. So not dissimilar from you, Deegan. I still remember the time I saw uh, Saturn through my telescope when I was a little kid. Uh, I recall vividly begging my mother to buy... Oh, there's a uh, much better, clearer view of the Seder region that's pop just popped up, and you can see a much, so much more detail. That is a beautiful view. Tegan's doing a quick stretch here of the data, and you can see so much nebulosity. Tegan, can you describe a little bit about what exactly we're looking at? Uh, do we see a butterfly? Do we see... What are we seeing here? <laughs> so you would see a butterfly, you know, if this was a little bit um, a wider field of view, I guess you can stretch your imagination. The um, that that dark nebulous region in the uh, middle kind of stretching from the left to the right side of the image would be the body of the butterfly and the bright hydrogen alpha, you know, regions from the to the right and the left would be its wings. Um, so yeah, what you're seeing here is just a lot of hydrogen alpha data. If you look in closer here, let me zoom in a tad. Um, you can see these denser regions, um, and that's actually, you know, stars form in those regions. But Kyle, you may be able to help me out here. The, this dark nebulosity in the center that we're seeing, is this very dense gas with stars in front of it, or is this, um, you know, very, very little gas with stars behind it? That's a good question. So what we're seeing here is sort of a dark, is called dark nebulosity. So mm -hmm. it is gas. It's a gas that's very cold, very, very cold gas, uh, molecular uh, gas, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. It's basically interstellar dust. And it is not well lit up because it's not, it's very cold. And what you're seeing, the stars are stars that's in front of it. So what you're looking at is called a dark nebulosity. So I'm actually running a, um, f a five minute exposure this time to see if we can bring out a little bit more detail. Um, also, John Richards asked how my guiding is and PhD, my arc second RMS. Um, if I check right now, um, I am at 0 0.50 on the, on the dot. And this fluctuates from, you know, from night to night. Sometimes I'm at 0.3, sometimes I'm at 0.8. Um, but 0.5 right now is pretty pretty average for the CEM60 and uh, my Newtonian. Good deal. And keep the suggestions coming, guys. If you want to see something else after this, uh, please let us know in the comments. We'll be more than happy to share them. Uh, we've got a question from Mike. Uh, Mike wanted to know, how do you control dew on your Newtonian? I've only had a couple of issues with dew, actually frost, and it was on my secondary mirror. Um, I haven't, the only thing that I, I was able to do is make a custom dew shield extending about two, a, a foot and a half to two feet outwards um, from my secondary, and that turns your Newtonian to a five and a half tube 
<laughs> um, other than that, you can get a dew heater and kind of wrap it around the top of the secondary. I've seen people do, but the the dew shield is is what helped helped me combat frost in the winter. Haven't had an issue this summer or this spring yet. Beautiful. Let's see some more suggestions that come through. Um, pinwheel, we already said we can't do. Crab, we cannot do because that's a uh, winter object. Uh... Someone said cat's paw. Cat's paw, you know, I think, was one that came by earlier, yeah. Yeah, that's a little too low for me, and it's actually behind the trees, unfortunately. A target that I would love to shoot. Um, How about the, the uh, bubble nebula? Is that is that out, or...? Yes, um, that was. I was going to suggest the bubble nebula or the crescent nebula to shoot, and I think the bub bubble nebula would be um, excellent because with the 10-inch Newtonian, you can really start to see some of the internal structure of the bubble, and it looks spherical just through a photograph. And it's so we'll do the bubble nebula next. I will say from experience, though, talking about dew, I live here in central Florida. Um, unfortunately, the weather just did not cooperate for me tonight, so I couldn't provide my own views tonight. But living here in central Florida, I will say that, wow, yeah, every night is 100% humidity, 100% cloudy, 100% sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I haven't had a clear night in, in, in weeks. So uh, I'm exper experiencing this again. It's just, you know, it's such a great feeling because I feel like I'm out in the field with Tegan. Yeah, it's being able to share, you know, my, it's, it's awesome. But contrarily speaking, I've had eight or nine clear nights in a row. Mm -hmm. So I've been taking advantage of it. Um, and it's been a very nice break in the weather. And we have one minute left on this uh, next sub exposure here, and then we will review that quickly and then switch to um, the bubble nebula. I think that's um, a great also idea. NGC 7635. And it should be um, should be right overhead almost. For sure. Uh, Hector asking, when will the Andromeda Galaxy be visible? I'm new to this. So right now the Andromeda Galaxy is only visible in the morning, early in the morning. So just after, just mm -hmm. before... Uh, sunrise so unfortunately andromeda galaxy is not out right now but it will be in a few months that is probably the best fall time object to be able to observe okay uh t minus 10 seconds here for this next sub exposure and how long of an exposure was this was this tegan this was a five minute sub exposure um Exciting. i did bend my camera um significantly here but nice. the signal and the detail is incredible. <laughs> nice. a uh, got, a question. got a question from James, and they're saying, I have a 6-inch Dobsonian, and will I see a major difference if I go to a 10-inch rather than an 8-inch for deep sky viewing? And yes, you will. You will Absolutely. definitely see a huge, uh, a fairly significant increase. All right, so we're going to slew right over to the bubble nebula. Let me stop my guiding. And you might hear my telescope in the background. Hopefully this tree isn't blocking it. This might cut it close. Yes, my house is in front of the bubble nebula currently. I thought it was a lot higher up. Uh -oh. um, so the bubble nebula is <laughs> is not not no longer an option, unfortunately. Um, I can I'm sure look most to of see us can relate. <laughs> the elephant trunk nebula. Um, That'd be a somebody good one. somebody requested the elephant trunk nebula. Um, let me see if we have that in view. It is a little bit higher, but I don't know. Let's see. I see thirteen ninety six. I saw a question scroll by earlier that I didn't get a chance to answer. 
uh, for Tegan, actually. Uh, Tegan, how often do you collimate your, your uh, telescope after transportation? Well, luckily, you know, I don't, I transport it as little as possible. Um, I just got my, my telescope dialed in about two weeks ago, you know, collimation. Not perfect because, you know, as you can see, even in this image on the screen, if I zoom in a tad, the uh, stars in the corners, um, you know, are not perfect. They look pretty good here, but they're not perfect. Um, so once I get collimated, I keep it on my mount and I keep it outside under a Telegizmo 365 um, and I don't move it ever <laughs> just to prevent any kind of, you know, adjustments in the in the mirrors. Good deal. So I think we're open to the elephant trunk nebula here. I'm going to take a quick 15 second exposure and see if we can't see that. And if so, I will increase it to a three minute. And again, when that 15 minute or 15 second exposure comes in, uh, you're going to see a relatively gray image. And again, that's totally normal. That's just a result of a 15 second exposure. You're not going to see much detail. But as Tegan increases the no as increases the exposure, you're going to see a lot more detail. But while that exposure is coming in, uh, I got a question from Matt. Matt is asking, can we see the James Webb Space Telescope? Uh, that is a good question, Matt. And we can, actually, with a telescope the size of Tegan's. We're not going to tonight because we don't have the coordinates. But if we wanted to, we could technically show a view of the James Webb Space Telescope. Bear in mind, though, it's not going to appear as anything more than a very, very dim star. It is very far away from the Earth, and it is very, very small. Okay, so what you're seeing here is just a my um, framing um, tool. The Elephant Trunk Nebula was in view, but the very tip of the trunk was at the bottom of the screen, so I'm just readjusting here so we can get a clear view. Um, I think it's going to look pretty good once we get that centered. You're probably going to hear Tegan's mount sort of adjusting around. That's totally, that's totally normal. What Tegan's doing is again just sort of plate solving and just narrowing down the exposure. Um, for those who are wondering, uh, the Elfin's Trunk Nebula is about 2,400 light years away from the Earth, and it is located in the constellation of Cepheus. It's also known as IC 1396. Okay, so yeah, after that 15 second exposure, you can somewhat see a outline of the Elephant Trunk Nebula. But here, after this uh, three minute sub exposure, um, it will be much more prominent. This is one of the targets that um, what really inspired me when I first started astrophotography. It, uh, um, Tegan, I have a suggestion absolutely. for a, a next yes. target. We could also probably take a look at uh, Pickering's Triangle. Oh yes, that's a good one. That is a great, absolutely. That is a great one. Uh, that was a suggestion from Mike. Thank you, Mike, for the suggestion. I got a question from John. Is this, they're asking, is it advisable to collimate a new telescope? Uh, I would recommend doing it for sure. Just if you've never done it before, for example, if you've never owned a Dobsonian telescope, the first thing I did was to make sure it was collimated, and I actually used a like a laser collimator to be able to line up the mirrors. So I would say it is advisable to learn a col how to collimate a new telescope if you're using a reflector. If you're using a smith cassegrain grain, leave that bad boy alone unless you absolutely need to. smith cassegrain grain collimation is way, way harder. What I found personally, you know, I, I um, received my quattro in the mail and I put it, you know, onto the mount and I did a test image and it was already perfectly collimated from factory. So I didn't make any adjustments until we moved across the country and it got, you know, rattled around a bit in the, um, the moving trailer. And that's when I started my collimation process, which was about six months after initially, um, receiving it in the mail. Um, so if it's not broke, don't fix it. But a laser, like Kyle said, is, is a perfect tool and then finish it off with a star test. We have a question coming in that's going to ignite tons of debate. Uh, <laughs> what's the best telescope? <laughs> that's a good, that's a funny one. That's a good question. Uh, to answer it, and I'm not trying to be coy, 
the best telescope is a telescope that works for you. Um, exactly. It's the one that fits the needs best for you. Uh, Tegan's using a reflector for his astrophotography. I personally don't enjoy using reflectors because they just can be kind of a pain to adjust the mirrors all the time and you also have to deal with cooling. I like to use refractors for my astrophotography. Um, the only downside is that Tegan has a significant upside on me when it comes to aperture. So Tegan can collect a lot more signal than my puny uh, 70 millimeter refractor can. But at the same time, I don't have to worry about collimating my mirrors all the time. So it's a, it's a definitely a challenging one. Upsides and downsides, absolutely. And I've owned both um, reflectors and APOs, just as you have, Kyle. Um, and while refractors are, you know, plug and play almost, you know, Newtonians do give you that extra aperture, which to me is, you know, that's what I strive for, the, the details and the, and the the signal to noise. And it's, you know, with a nice 200-millimeter um, APO, you get those significantly wider field objects that I just don't have access to. Oh, there, there's that three-minute exposure we're coming up. Wow. And Tegan is just showing exactly what he's talking about here. He has 10 inches of aperture, and that is pretty substantial. And as a result, he's able to get incredibly clear images. So what you're looking at again here is the Elephant Trunk Nebula. It is a concentration of interstellar gas and dust located in the constellation Cepheus, about 2,400 light years away from the Earth. Uh, it is called the Elephant Trunk Nebula because it, as it appears to resemble, looks like an elephant trunk. It is an absolutely beautiful object to image. And it's, you know, when you're doing astrophotography, for those who, you know, are new to the hobby or aren't really familiar with the, um, the process of astrophotography, you take, you know, multiple exposures like this and you stack it on top of each other and the single image turns into a much a less noisy image with much higher detail and signal to noise ratio and it results in a much cleaner crisper image and so that is the goal to get as much exposure time on a single object as you can to improve your image quality that's very true it's also why you hear astrophotographers say things insane like i took a 26 hour exposure of this and that <laughs> And they're not exaggerating. They really did. They uh, A lot of those astrophotographers are doing it by filter, though. So they maybe will take eight hours, one filter, eight hour, another filter, eight hour, another filter. Most astrophotographers aren't so extreme where they'll be up literally the entire night. Uh, a lot of astrophotographers will have like a s automation to their s astrophotography so they could set, set it, let it run, let it change filters, and they can sleep while their telescope's doing imaging. That way they can wake up in the morning, get their cup of coffee, and they'll be treated to tons of, of uh, beautiful images. Although I've never, I always have, anytime I've tried that and left my telescope outside for the night, I've always had something go just terribly wrong. <laughs> and I don't know why. Typically those errors happen at Meridian Flip. They, um, almost always, when, yeah. Almost always. The real and, insults when it happens 10 minutes after I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, ex you know. It happens, and that's the troubleshooting is fifty percent of astrophotography, I think, and it's uh, it's it's very enjoyable sometimes. I'd and say frustrating. I'd say astrophotography <laughs> is what fifty percent uh, troubleshooting, forty percent uh, sitting around doing nothing while your images go, and then maybe like five percent processing, and then the other five percent you spend your time telling people you're doing astrophotography. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, good 04MJ Roblox asked me what telescope this is called. This is the Skywatcher Quattro 10 inch. It's a 10 inch reflector. Good deal. And we have just another three, three minute sub exposure popping up on the screen now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and slew to Pickering's Triangle, which I already have up in the sequence, ready to go. For sure. And Pickering Triangle will probably be where we wrap up for the night. Um, that way, T can get to imaging his targets for the night. He can take advantage of another clear night. William Lyon can know, are we live stacking? We are not live stacking. This is a single sub-exposure. Uh, I thought it'd be cool. I like to do just sub-exposures because I like to show just how much detail you can actually see with a single sub-exposure.
Okay, so we have a 15 second sub exposure coming here on um, Pickering's triangle to make sure everything's centered and aligned. And then we will continue with another, um, maybe a five minute exposure this time. Good deal. This is a fairly bright target located um, it's a part of the Veil Nebula. Okay. So some, somewhat dim for this 15 second exposure. Um, and what filter are you using, Tegan, for this? Are you just using HA? HA, 3 nanometer hydrogen alpha. All right, we're going to go ahead and run a uh, four-minute sub-exposure on this one. It's a good, show, good, good idea. So the Veil Nebula uh, and Pickering's Triangle and are all part of what's called the Cygnus Loop, and it's a supernova remnant. It is a remnant of a supernova that happened many ten to twenty thousand years ago. Uh, it was a star that was at least twenty times as massive as the sun, and when the supernova happened it would have been brighter than the planet Venus in the nighttime sky, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Venus is a very bright planet, so seeing something this bright, way brighter than Venus, would have been an amazing sight to see. Uh, estimates are about, uh, generally speaking, this nebula ranges from about 1,200 to over 6,000 light years across, and that is a huge, huge nebula. There's lots of oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen here as well. Yes, I would say the oxygen and the uh, hydrogen are pretty close, if not, you know, the oxygen signal being a little bit more pre relevant, prevalent than the hydrogen, which um, is typically rare. But for supernova remnants and you know planetary nebula, it's it's more the case that oxygen is more is a, more abundant than it typically is in an emission nebula. And Jonathan asked um, what mount I am using. Um, again, I am using the Optron CEM60. Just the standard version, not the EC. So we have about two minutes left on this next exposure. And again, guys, please keep the questions coming. This will probably be our final target for the night. Uh, while we're doing that. Uh, one thing I like to do in these streams that I totally forgot that I haven't done yet is I like to see where people are watching from. So go ahead in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Give us a uh, give us an idea where everybody's located because it is so cool to see like this large international audience that comes into our streams. We got Susan checking in from New Jersey. We got Diane checking in from Clifton, New Jersey. Richard checking in from Belgrade, Montana. Uh, Jennifer checking in from Michigan. Doug checking in from North Carolina. Very cool. From Maine, we got Katherine checking in from Hollywood, Florida. Adam checking in from Southern Indiana, so not terribly far away from you, Tegan. Yeah, here in Cincinnati. That's correct. Steve checking in from Holbert, Oklahoma. Hector checking in from Austin, Texas. Scott checking in from Atlanta. Good deal. Saw a question coming in from James. Uh, James is say, asking for much different in price. Do the 10 to 1 Crayford focusers make critical focus a lot easier? Thanks. I actually don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Uh, how about you, Dean? Um, I'm, I'm wondering which Newtonian he's referring to that, um, a 10 inch, or that doesn't have a, a Crayford, a 10 to 1. But that being said... It definitely does help. Um, I use my 10 to 1. If I'm using a Batonov mask to focus the um, this Newtonian that we're currently viewing through, I always use the um, the 10 to 1, the uh, the fine tube knob, tune knob to uh, 
get sharp focus and it makes a huge difference beautiful and we just have that final sub -ex that exposure come in and that is a beautiful shot look at all the detail that you can see that's so much nebulosity again this is a remnant of a supernova that occurred 10 to 20,000 years ago in the past that was visible from the earth when it did so this is a star that is long dead that has exploded and has shot out its cosmic guts into space and it's just beautiful to see Alan wanting to know what would happen if he used the L Extreme with the 294 uh, monochrome. Uh, the L Extreme is designed mm -hmm. more for color cameras, but I would imagine what would happen is you would start getting, you would get similar images because technically the L Extreme is kind of a narrowband filter, but you would get like oxygen and hydrogen at the same time. It would and it wouldn't be, be ideal. It, it wouldn't be a colored image either. Yeah. Um, it would be yeah. It would be a monochrome image, and. It would be odd to layer that onto a colored image. Actually, I don't know what kind of results you would get, but yeah. it would be pretty interesting. Not ideal, I would say. <laughs> yeah, for the price, you might as well just get a narrowband filter. Beautiful views. So it looks like I'll give one final call for questions if you have anything you want to know about astronomy in the nighttime sky. But this will probably be where we wrap up for the night. We've been going for a good almost uh, almost hour and a half at this point. So one last call for questions. And if no further questions, we'll probably call the night. Let Tegan get back to imaging and getting some good photos that I know he's really eager to get. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bruce asked me where I'm imaging from that I can hear the mount slewing, but not the mosquito strikes. Um, every time the mosquito bites, I mute it. So you guys can't hear those. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm imaging from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Right now, the humidity is at about 32%, so that's not typically the case. It's usually 70s, 80%, and the mosquitoes are horrendous. Um, not like Kyle, of course, down in Florida, but... I had a mosquito lucky. nearly carry me away the other day. It was insane. <laughs> it was the size of a dog. I was, I was, luckily, I was generally terrified. <laughs> I'm not seeing any of those tonight, um, but it's been been nice cool it's i think around 67 degrees right now so crisp clear night um low humidity perfect for deep space imaging for sure uh one last question from mike they're asking what is the f ratio and how long of an exposure i believe this is a four minute exposure and the f ratio uh tegan i think it's f5 no f39 okay um so you know when using a three nanometer filter um there is a little band shift, um, meaning the the sensor isn't capturing all of the potential light that it could through the three nanometer filter simply because it's a faster scope. Um, if I was at f five, the signal um, could be you know maybe a little stronger. But that being said, f three point nine, um, a ten inch aperture. Steve wanting to know how do you find nebulas with an eight inch Dobsonian? Um, easiest way to do that would be get like a Telrad, for example. Familiarize yourself with the concept of star hopping, which we do have an article on star hopping on the Astronomy Hub website on highpointscientific.com. Uh, look, use an app like Stellarium, for example, and um, point around towards, um, just sort of familiarize yourself with some of the brighter stars in the nighttime sky and just sort of hop around until you sort of narrow down on a nebula. Uh, you can start off by finding really easy nebulas, like the Orion Nebula, for example, in the constellation of Orion the Hunter. Um, the Lagoon Nebula in constellation of Sagittarius, for example, another good one. And just sort of familiarize yourself with some of the brighter nebula, and then maybe move on to some less bright nebula, and then some galaxies as well. And uh, Richard also... Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Uh, Richard, John Richard, sorry, mentioned... Uh, 
and they want to address the amp glow in the upper right hand corner of the image. And it looks like a starburst almost. And that's inherent to some CMOS camera sensors. Looks like we got the Crescent Nebula. Just a quick one before we head out. I thought we might be able to get another one in here. Yeah, I agree. That's a good, that's a very good idea. Wow. Look at the detail on that. It's amazing. So if, see if we can zoom in here a bit. Another awesome one for all size telescopes for astrophotography. Um, beautiful wide field if you have a nice refractor and a fantastic tar target for uh, Newtonians to get that inner filamentary detail. It's a good deal. Well, if I'm not, I don't see any more questions from the audience, Tegan, and we've looked at an amazing array of, wow, I mean, I just can't get over how beautiful that is, Tegan. That's amazing. But we've looked tonight, we've looked at the Dumbbell Nebula, the Cygnus Wall, Pickering's Triangle, the Seder region, um, the Crescent Nebula, a lot of beautiful nebulas tonight, and it's been absolutely great so far. Man, I just can't get over how beautiful that is. That's so great. That I, I, wish <laughs> really, I, had a, I wish I had really a clear nice. night. I wish I really <laughs> wish I did. But if there are no further questions, I think we are going to wrap up the stream for the night. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for the evening. It was absolutely fantastic to talk in each and, to each and every one of you. I hope this guy's, this views we've shown you has sort of helped you to you know, go out and do astrophotography on your own and sort of get your own images because it's just so much fun. It can be kind of stressful too, but astrophotography is, in my opinion, one of the most rewarding hobbies. But until next time and to our next stream, my name is Kyle and I was joined tonight by Tegan here at High Point Scientific.